or whatever the time is, it is uh, exactly 12 p.m. London time, it's 11 a.m. GMT, uh, when in the British summer time, so there's a confusion about the time frame. Uh, welcome all on behalf of Sadiq International Virtual University. I'll just say one couple of words that uh, it is a matter of great privilege, honor, and delight to have a bus run for a famous, very renowned transform surgeon from St. George's University in London as our guest speaker today. I mean, a bus is so popular here that last year in December when we had IMI conference uh, in Pakistan, he was requested to run a workshop, a live workshop, and also to transfer technology. So Abbas has been doing a lot of good work, academic, but he's so busy, it's so difficult to get hold of him. I'm grateful to Abbas that he has given us this opportunity and some time to discuss the nuances of transplant surgery. He is a master speaker, and a couple of years ago, we did a program on Alabama TV. I still recall it was one of the best um, webinars, lectures, and directed discussion that we had. So uh, may I welcome your Abbas Bazanfar? And I'll just say one more word that uh, we are now entering the second year of our activity, Sadiq International Virtual University. The first, uh, the inaugural lecture was held on 17th of May, 2020, which was conducted by, which was delivered by Professor Larijani of Tehran University. So we have completed a whole cycle, and this is the uh, first lecture in the new year. So over to you, and Hussein Shabi will moderate. Hussein Shabi is at King's College, a consultant cardiologist. Over to you, Hussein, and kindly proceed. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Um, hope everyone's had a blessed Ramadan, Eid Mubarak. We're back to doing our medical ed education. So it's an honor today to introduce Dr. Gazanfer for the webinar. Um, I'll give a bit of background. He, Dr. Gazanfer is a senior transplant surgeon, senior lecturer at St. George's University Hospital in London. And his interests are live donor renal transplantation, renal transplant and complex recipients, dual kidney transplant. He has research academic interests. He's the lead for vascular access surgery and lead for transplant medical education. Um, and his research interests include utilization of deceased donor organs for transplantation. He qualified in Peshawar in the, in the 90s and completed general surgical training at King Edwards Medical College and Mayo Hospital in Lahore in Pakistan, and then his fellowship degree. He moved to the UK in the early 2000s and did research fellowship at Manchester Royal Infirmary, and his training include multi-organ retrieval, kidney transplant in pediatrics, adults, pancreas transplantation surgery, and he has profound interest in research and medical education. He's presented nationally, internationally, and published in renowned articles. He's an expert journal reviewer in multiple um, journals, and he's actually involved in medical education. It's an honor for us to have uh, him speak today for Sardik Virtual University. Um, before I hand over, please do post any questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll endeavor to ask them at the end of the lecture. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Abbas Gazanfer. Sorry, Dr. Abbas, if you can please unmute. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much uh, for the invite. Um, thank you, everyone. And it's a privilege to be here to uh, present uh, an overview about uh, transplantation. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen now. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Right, okay. So um, we'll spend around uh, next uh, 45 minutes or so, uh, 40 to 45 minutes to have an overview about transplant. Now, renal transplant is, is a very vast um, subject. It is not only um, um, transplant surgery itself. It is a combination of various uh, specialties or multidisciplinary team approach that makes a transplant successful. So starting from a patient who is under care of a nephrology team or a general medical team to fitness for their um, cardiological fitness and their other fitnesses and all the way to have a successful transplant and then follow up of transplant. It is a multidisciplinary team approach that makes uh, a transplant a success story. So in this uh, today's presentation, I will try to cover <clears throat> major, major highlights 
about uh, transplantation and I'm happy to take uh, any questions at the end. And if there are any queries or anything and that time runs out, I'm happy to have any discussion uh, later on in any other forum. Now, renal transplant is considered as a gold standard treatment uh, for all the patients, uh, or not all, but the patients for end-stage renal failure. And the reason why it is a gold standard treatment, because it improves someone's quality of life, uh, it improves life expectancy, it, uh, it has a socioeconomical benefit to our society, and also it is cost-effective for the healthcare providers. Now, coming to the very first thing, uh, about improving the quality of life. Generally speaking, the patient um, who are uh, endostranial failure in any other renal replacement therapy than uh, transplant, they have their commitment to that dialysis program, i.e. it may be uh, hemodialysis where they have to have dialysis three times a week minimum or a peritoneal dialysis where they also have to exchange bags on regular basis most uh, often on daily basis, which does impact on their quality of life, on their employment, and on their various activities. As compared to um, that, the transplant, they, if they have a transplant, they can live a normal life. Now, um, historically, if we go back 20 years or two uh, decades ago, uh, kidney transplant, pancreas transplant, they were not considered as life-saving organs. Maybe the, the lung transplant, heart and liver transplant were considered as uh, life-saving organs. But now when the data is coming out after long-term follow-up data is coming out from other organs, uh, it uh, is now um, significant data to prove that life expectancy does improve long-term life expectancy after renal transplantation. Um, and pancreas transplantation or bowel transplantation. Um, so it may not immediately improve the quality of life, but the uh, long-term life expectancy is uh, better. Then the socioeconomical benefit is if someone has got a normal quality of life, have got a better life expectancy, they become a better member of society. They can um, do jobs, they can do various other activities, which they uh, probably would not be able to do because of their engagement to any other uh, dialysis replacement or renal replacement uh, um, therapies. And then in the, also for the healthcare providers, um, it, it is cost effective. Now, this is very important thing in, in, in sectors like, for example, in, in the UK, uh, where uh, healthcare is provided by fully funded by uh, the government, then obviously it is cost effective to the government, but it is more relevant to the countries uh, where people have to bear the cost of their own treatment. For example, if someone is in dialysis in, in Pakistan or in India, the average dialysis will cost them about 4,000 rupees. Uh, and then about three dialysis means about 12,000 rupees in a week time. And that can be one kind of a one third of a salary of, of, of a person as compared to if someone have got a functioning transplant um, then the cost of uh, maintenance immunosuppression is around one fourth the cost of uh, dialysis. Now when we consider uh, at a treatment options for a renal replacement a patient with end stage renal failure. It can be a comfort care, someone who is not suitable for any treatment approaching end stage um, of their life. So they can just have a comfort care. It can be a peritoneal dialysis, it can be a hemodialysis, but the main focus is renal transplantation because of its uh, superior benefit to rest of uh, modalities. Now, uh, this is a recent uh, publication um, uh, last year in, in, in Lancet when they looked at the global disease burden of chronic kidney disease. So if we, we can see that there are about 600, around 700 million uh, patients uh, all, uh, who have all cause um, and chronic kidney disease um, globally recorded their prevalence is about more than 9%. And with a mortality of about 1.2 million uh, patient, uh, people died with uh, chronic kidney disease in the year 2017. Um, and obviously, um, the, the impact of this disease um, is, is very high. It is, it is a disease burden um, and particularly affects um, uh, the, the countries or the, or the people with the lower socioeconomic um, uh, 
background. And then when we look at, at the at uh, um, the uh, chronic kidney disease um, uh, about their uh, various uh, things that can affect or, or disability or just as life is, um, the various things can impact the top one is diabetes, the, the top two um, things are related to diabetes and then glomerulonephritis, hypertension, other things can also play, but majority diabetic nephropathy is the major um, the, pathology that can affect all of these chronic kidney disease uh, patients or have got a heavy disease burden globally. And then again, diabetes may is common, um, obviously, um, uh, cause of um, chronic kidney disease, but in Asian population or, or in, in the countries, poor countries, the um, risk of diabetes and hypertension is uh, more than um, anywhere else. Now, when we look at um, the um, survival analysis of patients um, with chronic kidney disease and their um, uh, various modalities which they have used. So if you see the top um, uh, left one, uh, this is the overall survival um, uh, curve for uh, chronic kidney disease. And if you see the bottom right one, that is a comparison with the transplantation. Uh, then this is related to peritoneal dialysis, the top right one or the bottom left one is hemodialysis. So if you see all these curves, you can clearly see the difference that the transplantation improves someone's life expectancy. So this is a median eight-year um, survival of the patient. And obviously the survivor is much superior after transplantation. Now having uh, um, kind of a make a case that transplant, renal transplantation is a superior um, uh, modality for um, treatment of chronic kidney disease. Um, there were attempts to do transplant for more, about uh, more than 100 years ago, when the first successful transplants were performed uh, in Austria, when they were start, um, or, um, when they started to do um, in animal models, and then um, there were experimental transplant performed in in in, um, in animals, in humans, in France, and there were various other um, transplant activities were performed, but unfortunately, none of these worked because it was not um, known that there is a immunological basis for organ rejection. So whenever a transplant was performed before, it was not compatible. And all of them probably was at that time uh, were lost because of a hyperacute rejection or thrombosis or various other risks. Um, it was in 1940s that Sir Peter Madover from University of London um, experimented and he then found that there is an immunological basis to organ transplantation. It is not possible to put uh, just kidneys without or any organ without knowing the immunological basis. And once we know the immunological basis, the next major breakthrough in 1950s was the steroid-like medicine was used to suppress this immune system at the human body defense mechanism um, so that the transplant became a success story. And it was in 1954 when uh, Professor Joseph Murray from uh, Boston performed the first successful kidney transplant between two identical twin sisters. And that was the first transplant performed. And uh, actually both of the sisters um, uh, lived quite re up to quite recently. Um, so. Um, that is uh, kind of evaluation of, of the transplant, and this is the first transplant picture perform, performed by Prof. Uh, Marie in Boston. Now, in, <clears throat> in this uh, um, session, what we will try to do is we will have an overview of the transplant. And the transplant overview starts from how one should prepare someone for renal transplantation, then come to a renal transplant surgery, then um, dealing with the post-operative complication and the post-operative follow-up or, or care of the transplant. So organ transplantation, any organ transplantation, and uh, particularly now we're focusing on kidney transplant, is not like any other surgery. It is not like appendicectomy. It is not like cholecystectomy. It is not even like a cancer surgery. It is different, and it is different because um, you have to have a patient and the clinician have a, have a full lifetime commitment to that process of transplantation. So once we have done a transplant surgery, even then because of their immunosuppression medicine and various other things, that patient need to regularly followed up uh, by the clinician for the rest of their life. And they develop a very um, kind of a 
uh, binding between a patient and, 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 and their treating physicians rather than someone who is coming and you've done an appendicectomy or cholecystectomy and you might not see that patient again in your life. Now, pre-transplant uh, preparation is um, the key thing uh, in, in, in the transplant to start with. It starts from the timing of the preparation, at what time one should start thinking about organ transplantation or kidney transplant, <clears throat> what is the fitness of the recipient for that surgery, then one, when one should perform a transplant and then uh, any immediate pre-surgery care or, or management. Now coming to the <clears throat> uh, timing of uh, preparation, it varies. It depends upon um, nature of the disease. Um, it will be different uh, because of what is the pathology causing the renal failure. As generally, as a rule of the thumb, it depends upon what will be the rate of decline of a GFR of that person. So for example, a normal GFR, a bookish normal GFR is 100 to 120 um, ml per minute, uh, but generally speaking, any you know, glomerular filtration rate more than 90 uh, ml per minute, we will take that as a normal GFR. And then generally speaking, there is about one ml per minute per year decline in, a, in someone's GFR, which is age-related GFR decline. So if someone who is um, more than, uh, he is less than 20, his GFR will not be same, even if the kidney is all normal at the age of 60, there will be some age-related decline in their kidney function. But when the kidneys are diseased, um, their rate of decline of GFR is accelerated. It can be two, it can be 10, it can be 20, um, uh, every year. And that is how it will determine that how, what will be the timing of the preparation of that patient. Um, so the, the nature of the disease varies. It can be um, diabetic nephropathy, it can be hypertensive nephropathy, it can be autoimmune disease, it can be uh, polycystic kidney disease. So what we need to know is what is the nature, the rate of the decline of that, um, uh, of that uh, disease. Um, and that will help us to determine that timing for the, for the preparation. Then also, what are the as patient associated conditions or comorbidities that can, that can impact um, on, um, on their GFR or, or their timing of uh, transplantation? Generally speaking, we, um, we do a transplant in someone when they will approach end stage renal disease or CKD stage five, means that their kidney function or their GFR is less than 15 ml per minute. So this is the rule of thumb that uh, that is kind of a, all across the world that the, when they approach end stage renal failure, then we discuss about transplantation with them. Now, uh, what is the reason for that? Various reasons. One of the reason is um, in, in the countries like, for, for example, in the UK, um, there are around 14,000 plus patients waiting on a transplant waiting list with a GFR of less than 15. And also um, we perform about 5,000 um, transplants in the country. So the mean time or median, probably the median time for, for waiting for uh, patients on a transplant waiting list is about 3.8 years. So three years and eight months. Uh, if we start putting patients who are GFR above 15, then this time can go up to six years. And then we may end up transplanting patients who um, may still will not require uh, dialysis or may not re uh, require transplant uh, with a GFR of 20 or 25, but may get transplanted as well. So for that reason, the GFR is less than 15 ml uh, per minute. But then there are some other conditions that may impact someone's um, um, kind of a um, disease pattern. For example, if someone have got a, a severe cardiac issues or they have got uh, pulmonary fibrosis or they have got um, um, brittle diabetes or any other condition, for that reason, uh, we might have to raise that bar of GFR. And that is a national protocol, at least in the UK, is if someone is requiring a kidney pancreas transplant or kidney or uh, heart transplant, or they require a kidney or lung transplant, rather than GFR of 15, we go up to GFR of less than uh, 20. So we'll give that extra five of GFR um, so that they can be transplanted slightly uh, quickly, but if we are doing a dual organ transplantation for them.
then it also depends upon availability of live donor. Um, for example, if you have got a live donor who is committed to donate their organ and they want to do it now and your um, recipient GFR is 18, um, you will not say no that I do not want to do the transplant because uh, um, GFR is 18. Because if, if the donor is committed to do it now and he, he can only do it now, in a sense, in three months or six months, and they cannot commit themselves after a year or two years because of their family reason or because of various things, then you still can do the transplant. Um, so th we, this is, th then you have to tailor made uh, the timing of the transplant according to various reasons. There is also um, in UK or obviously in, in, in uh, majority of the developed countries now in, 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 in other developing countries as well, there is a scheme which is coming up as a kidney sharing scheme. Historically, if someone was ABO incompatible between donor and the recipient or HLA incompatible between the donor and the recipient, we were saying the transplant cannot proceed or we were doing ABO incompatible transplant or HLA incompatible transplant, which was a complex process. It was requiring plasma phrases. It was requiring sometimes splenectomy, although we have got very advanced medication like Campath and Rituximab and various other things, but still ABO incompatible or HLA incompatible transplant was um, not having a good long-term outcome for transplants. So therefore, this kidney sharing scheme has been introduced where you, we can swap the kidneys. For example, if A group to O is not possible. And then there is another person from um, A to O. So we can swap the kidneys um, like a chain um, so that everybody gets what they, what they need. And sometimes if we are putting a patient in a kidney sharing scheme, then again, we can put them in a kidney sharing scheme with slightly higher GFR because we might have to wait for six months to a year to one and a half year to get a suitable um, donor match. Then we have to follow whatever our national guidelines are, whatever country we are, they normally have uh, an agency that oversees um, transplantation and whatever guidelines they, they have, we have to follow. And uh, last but most important thing, the willingness of the patient for transplantation. Um, we have touched this on, the nature of the disease. So diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive, we have got glomerular disease, we have got vascular disease, we have got cystic kidney disease, uh, we have uh, a disease, congenital disease, obstructive or stone nephropathy, various things can impact on the things. And this is a very crowded slide, but this is this shows what is the decline of GFR um, on an average. So for example, in, in diabetes, it can range, the decline can, can, can be kind of a between five uh, to 12. Um, then uh, glomerular disease, it can be from one to nine. Hypertensive nephropathy, it can be from two um, to 10. So various things can impact or accelerate the decline of the kidney function, and that will help us planning um, the timing for the transplantation. Uh, patient condition and comorbidities, uh, which we touched briefly before. So there might be some absolute contraindication that uh, we cannot perform a transplant. For example, if someone have got active cancer, someone have got active breast cancer, they have got a colorectal cancer, they have got any active cancer, then we obviously cannot do the transplant because it will increase uh, um, the, the you know, spread of the cancer. Active infection, um, mainly active infection means then ac active long-term infection, or even in the short run, if someone have got a, um, a kind of a osteomyelitis or they have got a tuberculosis or they have got any um, active infection, we, we cannot do the transplant. And then if there is undiagnosed uh, pathology, we do not know what, what's, what is an underlying pathology. If someone have got a raised CRP and we do not know why it is. Someone have got a high voice cell count. We do not, not know why it is. So undiagnosed pathology is also an absolute contraindication for transplantation. Relative contraindications are, again, the th same things can uh, become a relative contraindication once they're treated. Um, neoplastic disease is not a contraindication once it's treated. A breast cancer, uh, someone had a quadridectomy or mastectomy, completed their radiotherapy, chemotherapy, two years after completion of treatment, there is no recurrence, they can have a transplant. Colorectal cancer, after two years of the same thing, they can have a transplant. So once they have completed their treatment, and without recurrence, a majority of the cancer within two years and some of the advanced cancer, for example, melanoma and sarcomas, after five years, they can receive their transplant if there is no recurrence. 
chronic infection, tuberculosis, treat it, once treated, no recurrence, in three months, someone can be transplanted. Or if there is any other organ failure, for example, someone have got a heart failure, their ejection fraction was 15 or 20, and now if we have done something and their ejection fraction has improved or, or their suitability for surgery has improved, they can then again receive organ transplantation. The most important thing when we look at at the patient condition and morbidity is to see what is the life expectancy of that recipient because of their disease and comorbidities. So if someone's life expectancy is only a year or two years, then it won't make sense to um, take them through this whole process of transplantation. So the minimum in the UK life expectancy is five years before we can put someone on a national waiting list. And then there are some uh, um, other absolute contraindication, for example, um, uh, someone have got advanced lung disease, someone have got uh, um, low life expectancy, ischemic heart disease, severe peripheral vascular disease, uh, because essentially we have to put these organs somewhere. And I'll show you a slide that the later in the kidney transplant is goes in the iliac vessel. If someone have got a very bad peripheral vascular disease and by attempting to do a transplant, you are damaging their iliac vessels and someone end up having an amputation or something that obviously is not not right thing to do. Then um, their psychological assessment is very important. If someone have got um, significant uh, poor a controlled psychiatric illness, um, they cannot take their medicine, they cannot um, comply with the post-operative follow-up program, then obviously it, is, it will be challenging to do their transplant because they may not take their medication and they end up having rejections and multiple uh, other problems. And then morbid obesity. Now, this is a question nowadays, obviously, morbid obesity, BMI more than 40, is um, still kind of an, uh, comes under absolute contraindication, but the things are changing now. It, it is probably, um, I should have moved it from absolute to a relative contraindication because the new things are that people, even with a BMI of more than 40, uh, may get benefit from uh, renal transplantation. Um, that again, we have briefly discussed about availability of live donor kidney sharing scheme. We, if there are incompatible ABO, HLA incompatible transplant, and then altruistic donors um, is another important thing when we think about. So altruistic donor, if there's a altruistic donor a donation is the someone who just want to donate to someone um, without knowing them, just out of the goodness of their heart. So uh, if they want to donate uh, to an organ to help the society, to, um, um, to do kind of a, some benefit to someone they do not know. And if there is, an, if there is a direct altruistic donor, uh, an undirected altruistic donor, and if there is an altruistic donor donating to a person, even if whatever their GFR is, we may think about doing this transplantation, uh, transplant. Um, uh, disease organ guidelines, again, as I mentioned, um, GFR less than 15 is a national guideline, but then if someone is other uh, kidney pancreas transplant, liver kidney, pediatric transplant, um, they can be changed. Now, in UK, there is no urgent renal transplant list. There is no priority in the transplant waiting list except a pediatric transplant. So pediatric is classified as less than 16 years of age in, in a four for that reason. Uh, so they will be only getting a priority, but it is not like super urgent liver or super urgent heart or super urgent lung transplant. There is no priority um, list in, in UK. And again, patient willingness, they need to understand what are the risks and benefit of transplant. Um, they have to consent um, for the wait list. They have to consent for the surgery. And particularly nowadays, um, in, under this current COVID pandemic, they have to consent for um, to take this risk of that operation during COVID pandemic because the mortality of um, uh, someone with a renal transplant, if they get um, COVID, is around 25% recorded uh, mortality, which is one out of four. Although if we overall see the data which has been published and we have also published our own data from St. George's, the risk of um, COVID infection in renal transplant patient was only 2% as compared to dialysis population, which was around 16% because of the more exposure of them uh, because they were not able to shield, um, but the renal transplant patients were able to shield. <clears throat> so the new consent now we take is we do take about consent about shielding that the patient should shield and, and also the risk of uh, mortality if they uh, get uh, COVID infection. 
Uh, patient compliance is very important um, that they have to uh, show a commitment to this uh, transplant for life. So they need to understand that the transplant is not something that we have done. And uh, um, then after that, there is no commitment. They have to have lifetime commitment to the transplant, look after their organs, look after their health, take medication regularly, and then fitness for the surgery as well. We advise to bring their BMI down, medication we do not change, but stop smoking it has got a significant benefit uh, for perioperative recovery. Now, the, the way the things work um, when someone um, is uh, um, coming from a, uh, to a transplant program is that they will have their pre-transplant assessment done by a nephrologist. So the patient might be known to a nephrologist either from CKD stage one, very rarely, but most commonly it will be known to them by CKD stage three or four, maybe someone polycystic kidney, histiopolycystic kidney, diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy, nephrologists are dealing with them uh, and they are coming to a stage when they think the kidney function is uh, um, coming down and we start planning for their transplant or nephrology team starts planning from their transplant when they are CKD stage four, so that once they touch five, we activate them on a transplant waiting list or proceed with the transplant if there is a living donor. Um, we, it's been started by review of the patient history and their medical record, review of their investigation, examination, discussion with the patient, either active them, activate them, or suspend them on transplant waiting list, letter to the, all the teams involved, and then follow up or any investigation uh, of the results. Um, so uh, recipient fitness for the surgery um, is a, essentially their surgical review. Uh, so it, it starts from... Um, um, going through all of the background of the patient um, to uh, make sure that patient is surgically uh, fit for a surgery. For example, if someone have got uh, previously um, aortic um, stent, they have got a triple A and they have got uh, aortic um, um, EVAR or a stent, the stent is going into his iliac vessels. Or someone had a peripheral vascular disease and they have got a um, bypass surgery done in the past uh, or, or any other uh, thing that can make surgery a challenge. We need to review and know it beforehand. Um, we go through the history and examination of the patient. Um, risk and benefit are discussed um, and mainly the, the, there is a consent form that they need to sign um, uh, before um, going on active transplant waiting list. Then if there is a possibility of live donor, then we plan for the live donor. Um, Age of uh, recipient is is um, is not a, a contraindication. Um, that what age is out um, of uh, prospect for having someone a transplantation. It is their fitness for the surgery rather than the biological age. Um, someone who is 80 year old may be fit to receive a transplant, and someone who is 40 year old may not be fit uh, for the transplant because of their own various comorbidities. Um, body mass index is also um, an issue that needs to be um, discussed with the patient. If someone is um, has got a, um, sub -op, a very low BMI or their BMI is less than 16, uh, which means that they um, are um, very thin, they lean, um, then uh, essentially there is an increased risk of thrombosis. Um, and there is increased risk of having that compartment syndrome when we put the kidney into, into a small um, uh, abdomen. As compared to another thing, when someone's BMI is more than 40, there is a high risk of thrombosis, bleed, infection, wood DNCs, lymphocele, various things. So it is very important to um, um, see what is the body mass index of the patient. Now, body mass index is slightly uh, an old criteria, the new criteria which is developing now is the is what is the um, uh, waist, um, someone's um, abdominal girth or or waist of the abdomen because someone who is tall, and and someone who is uh, from different build, for example, um, uh, the uh, patients from Afro Caribbeans they have got a heavy skeleton, they have got a heavy muscles, so their BMI may be falsely high, but abdomen may be fine for the transplant. So therefore, it, it is a relevant assessment, not, not an absolute contraindication. 
as space for transplant. Um, uh, obviously, we need to, normally we do a transplant in right or left allic fossa. So make sure that there is a space, someone who have got a previously stoma or aliostomy or colostomy or something. Um, there we have to see them and make a plan for the surgery and the vascular issue. Someone have got a peripheral vascular disease. Someone have got any bypass surgery done in the past that can impact. Um, we need to be aware of these before. Now, out of all these things, age of the recipient has been a, the cause of concern or discussion for, for, for a long period of time. Um, historically, um, someone, when they were crossing 65, they were not considered as a, as a suitable um, uh, candidate or res for, for uh, receiving kidney transplantation. Um, so therefore, there are a lot of things have been done to establish what is a good age of the kidney and um, uh, to receive a kidney. And now the consensus is there isn't any age limit for adult transplantation. It is someone's um, fitness for, for, the, for the surgery rather than the biological age. So it is the life expectancy we go for. We do not go for, for age as a number. The only thing will be they might need some additional investigation particularly their cardiovascular assessments and, and looking at their iliac vessel um, to uh, that if we can do the transplant and where we can do the transplant and their post-operative care will be slightly advanced because of their age, but not a contraindication. Now we have done some of our own work and we published uh, about uh, um, renal transplant at age of 70 and does it improve someone's cardiovascular risk um, um, uh, assessment um, and then we, um, we have uh, presented it. And, and looking at, uh, we had um, a patient um, in cohort A where the median age was 73 compared with uh, our standard cohort of about uh, median age of uh, 47. Um, we looked at um, various um, donors, live donor, um, heart beating donor, non heart beating donor. It included a, a spectrum of the patient from various dialysis modalities from pre dialysis to hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. Um, and then we um, looked at their Q risk at the time of their transplant. What was it you know, a month after transplant, six months, and 12 months after transplantation? And we see a significant improvement in their Q risk. Um, when we follow them up up to up to up to twelve months following their um, transplantation, um, so actually the conclusion was that renal transplant is an acceptable best uh, treatment modality for uh, patients over the age of uh, seventy, and it significantly reduces the risk uh, cardiovascular risk uh, in in those patients after transplantation. Um, so the age should not be uh, considered as a as a contraindication, particularly when we're looking at their their cardiac outcome. Um, as well. Then looking at the BMI, um, BMI can be a limiting factor. Um, in in, in um, UK, there are about uh, uh, six centers who are doing uh, high BMI patients, and we are uh, one of uh, those six centers um, in UK where our cutoff of BMI, we go up to BMI of 42 um, as compared to general BMI of 37. And um, what uh, um, it, has now coming out or emerging internationally is that BMI maybe um, can increase slightly their their risk um, of um, uh, perioperative management of complication, but it is not an absolute um, contraindication. And we have also done um, a lot of uh, work on it um, to look at uh, uh, body mass index and the outcome of the transplantation. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just going to skip to do these things. Uh, but essentially, what um, our own study have uh, have uh, um, kind of uh, revealed that there isn't any significant uh, um, difference in outcome of these uh, patients with high BMI when compared to a standard BMI. Apart from very few things, the most common thing we picked up was a, was a lympho seal, which was treatable, um, and um, the graft survival. Uh, and morbidity, mortality, other things were not much different. So we should not um, disadvantage patients with a high BMI um, that uh, they are not suitable for transplantation. Um, then coming to the cardiovascular fitness is, is the key thing that we look for when we are um, planning for someone for, for transplantation. It starts from a simple uh, echocardiogram to look at the structure of the heart because dialysis or, uh, or renal failure 
um, is very commonly associated with hypertension. Hypertension is very commonly associated with left ventricular hypertrophy or, or the cardiac um, um, pathology, and also because of the dialysis and the fluid dynamics which change in human body because of renal failure and dialysis, it can impact on heart. So therefore, it is important for us to see an echocardiogram, which is the what is the structure of the heart. Then we look from, from the structure of the heart, what is, what is the perfusion of the heart? Um, it can be done kind of a doing an exercise ECG. We do myocardial perfusion scans. If myocardial perfusion scans come back and positive, we proceed to do an angiogram to look for any uh, major vessel coronary artery disease. And then it is not un, very uncommon to find someone who is completely asymptomatic uh, of any cardiac issues and picked up to go a uh, um, stenting or even bypass um, because they are picked up as a part of renal workup and that they have got um, an unknown um, or undiagnosed um, cardiac pathology either as which required a stent or, 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 or a bypass. And then we do the duplex scan for the leg vessels to see uh, what is the flow in the iliac arteries and iliac vessels. And sometimes we end up doing a, a CT angiogram if we um, find a, a stenosis or if we find calcification or if there is someone with a peripheral vascular disease. <clears throat> Now, the timing of the transplantation that we have uh, obviously discussed, uh, um, uh, just um, uh, I just mentioned before, um, ideal thing will be to have a preemptive transplantation. Preemptive means someone have got a kidney failure, and then we just do their transplant without any uh, dialysis in between. And the national um, guidelines are that at least 35% of the transplants, which we do from a cadaveric list, should be um, uh, preemptive. And for live donor, if there is a live donor in the family, then ideally it should be all preemptive. Obviously, we do not um, uh, normally see this uh, happening, but our aim should be that we should have about 65% of our live donor uh, as preemptive without exposing them to dialysis. And there are various reasons why it is. It is because any uremia or decline in urine output impacts on various other organs. Um, heart, it can lungs and can um, impact on, on various other things, vessels. So therefore, preemptive transplantation have got a better long-term and short-term outcome as compared to when someone is exposed to dialysis, particularly if the dialysis term is more than a year. And this is essentially um, what um, um, is that there are a lot of studies being done uh, which, which uh, suggests that if we do a preemptive transplantation, it is much superior to um, someone who is uh, having uh, interim dialysis, either peritoneal or hemodialysis, and then having a transplantation. Now, um, the pre-surgery care and management, the reason I put this slide here is um, to cover our cadaveric transplant um, uh, assessment. Now, in any part of the world, when someone is put on a national waiting list, there is a waiting time. It can be as short as uh, a couple of years in, in some countries where there is a very high rate of transplantation, for example, Spain, or for example, in, in uh, other part of uh, uh, the, the Europe as well, as compared to some countries where the waiting lists are very long because of uh, more patients uh, on the waiting list and less uh, donors. In UK, the average waiting time we quote is about three years and eight months. So if I put someone on a renal transplant list to today and I'm doing their transplant after uh, an a median of about 3.8 years later, and uh, when they come to me, I have to reassess them. Although we have got an annual um, uh, clinics to uh, quick clinics, nurse led clinics to review the patient to make sure they're always fit when they are on our active transplant waiting list. But when they come on the day of the surgery, we have to repeat everything again, take their history examination, do their investigation again, but that investigation will just ne need their blood ECG x-ray. We cannot arrange echocardiogram, we can, but it is very rare that we arrange an echocardiogram at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. that someone is going for the transplant. So we need to, um, these are the few investigation, for example, for the potassium, if they need a dialysis or any such investigation. We do their surgical assessment again, their medical assessment again, they will have their anesthetic assessment again. We then go through their immunospecial medication. And obviously the most important thing of all, 
is that we consent them again. Although when we, we do consent them before putting on an international waiting list, but that is a consent to go on list. And this consent particularly is a surgical consent <clears throat> where we are discussing the risk and benefit. And surgical consent uh, includes uh, uh, bleeding, uh, thrombosis, urinary leak, re-exploration, leg ischemia, if they have got any, um, may end up having a graft nephrectomy. Um, now coming to the operative procedure of, of uh, surgery itself, um, we do not take someone's own kidneys out when we do a transplant, except in pediatric transplant because of the space issue. But in adult transplantation, the kidney comes into either right aleic fossa or left aleic fossa. Preferably the first transplant comes into right aleic fossa because it is e easy to uh, mobilize um, uh, cecum on and medi medially to get a space on the left side because of the sigmoid colon, it is slightly a tighter space. Um, uh, so what normally happens in the surgery, it comes in the right iliac fossa. Um, uh, essentially, the artery goes with artery, the vein goes with vein, and ureter goes down to the bladder. Now, once the kidney is out from a human organ, uh, if it is a live donor transplant and we are just putting it straight away into, into a recipient, and then we normally just pack them in, in soltron or on a special um, fluid to preserve the organ. But if it is to transport, for example, if I'm taking the organ in the London and it is going to Glasgow or Aberdeen, then we have to put them in a storage machine. So the one on your right side is, an, is a static storage box where we put the kidney in, uh, which is like a, like a ice box. But on the left side is a, is a perfusion machine where we have to separately keep that per, um, uh, machine uh, that kidney perfused, we run some fluid and the kidney is perfused. It is a separate discussion. I'm happy to take that separately if someone is interested because this is one of my expertise as well. Now, um, um, kidney transplant surgery itself, once we get a kidney, we have to have a look at the kidney to look for any mass, um, anything that suggests that the kidney is not um, good. Then what we do is we do a backbench preparation of the kidney. We we dissect all the fat or gerota fascias out of the kidney and prepare it to be ready for the transplantation. Um, the NCN normally uses a Gibson NCN, which in the right fossa, it starts from the suprapubic area, it curves around um, uh, this um, the medial to anterior spialic spine, and then it goes up into a mid axillary line, um, slightly lateral to the mid axillary line. <clears throat> uh, essentially, we um, go wrong the external iliac artery and vein. It can go up to common iliac artery. It can go up to common iliac vein, but majority of 90% of the transplants are performed in external iliac vein and external iliac artery. And then essentially artery with the artery, vein with the vein, we clamp it, we do, um, do an astomosis. And then in the live donor transplant, majority of the time we are lucky lucky to see even the urine coming out as soon as we reperfuse the organ. And then this ureter goes down into the bladder. Um, various methods are being used. Um, we use uh, mucosa to mucosa and we put stents in all of our patients because if we do not put stent, the risk of urinary leak is slightly higher. And this is how the kidney will be um, a third kidney into the right iliac fossa. Now, um, so uh, there are various things. Um, some kidneys um, come with, uh, so th this is a standard kidney transplant where there is a one artery, one vein, one ureter, but then there are some <clears throat> kidneys, they come with multiple um, organs. So um, multiple arteries, multiple vein, or uh, two ureters or more than that. So essentially for the vein, if they are vein or of equal size, uh, we um, generally speaking, we uh, do uh, venous anastomosis of two veins. But if we have got a one big vein and then small arteries, a small other vein, then we can ligate those veins. It, it doesn't matter. But for arteries, because renal arteries are end arteries, so we have to uh, anastomose all of the arteries. So if there are two arteries, we do two anastomoses, three artery, we do three anastomoses. Otherwise, whatever part we are not anastomosing, the kidney will be dead and that part of the uh, graft function will be lost. Um, and then uh, we also do um, end block transplantation. So this is a standard transplantation, but then sometimes we have to do um, 
and block transplantation, particularly when we are um, using a children organ or if the organ of a very young child is being used in an adult. Um, so we, the, the size of the kidney of, a, of, of that child is not. So this is called nephron mismatch, that a children child kidney cannot um, kind of serve the purpose for an adult uh, person as a single organ. So therefore we do a dual kidney transplant and that was the first dual kidney transplant performed in the country from a 19 month old heart, non heart beating donor. Uh, I was part of that, that team. And this is what we do is we put these both uh, um, uh, as an end block into um, ves iliac vessels. And as you can see, there's very small kidneys, but working very well. And um, uh, the patient um, is still in our follow up program and it has been almost um, 12 years and the kidneys are doing fantastic. And then the other extreme is a dual kidney transplantation. So, um, sorry, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, so can I have another five to 10 minutes or I have to wrap up quicker than that? Uh, no, that's okay. You, you can do that. Right. Okay. Um, the, so, the, so other extreme, um, so one uh, part of dual kidney transplant is when we are thinking about nephron mismatch from child to an adult. And the other part of nephron mismatch is when we have got very elderly patient uh, donor to an, uh, a recipient. So for example, as, as we discussed at the very start of the presentation that there is a normal GFR decline um, in, in age-related decline in a person. So if I have got someone who is uh, about 80 year as a donor and their kidney function is around uh, uh, 50, and if I take one kidney and give it to one recipient and second kidney to a second recipient, that recipient probably got a kidney function not more than 25 which means that we are just moving them uh, from CKD stage um, um, five to four. And then this kidney function within the next three years will um, come down to 15. And then uh, with after four years, they will again looking for dialysis. So historically, the patient, when they were, our donors, when they were crossing 70, uh, we were not taking their organs out. But then we sat down about 10 years ago and we started looking at how we can improve it. And then we did some, some work and I was part of that team and we started to do um, dual kidney transplantation. So essentially now dual kidney transplant is an established program in, 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 in UK uh, where we essentially uh, put two kidneys, two adult older um, uh, donors kidneys into uh, a recipient. Now, the, 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 just very quickly, um, when we say about disease donor, um, or uh, so we classify them as standard criteria donor, SCD, uh, which is someone now less than 55 or 60. They don't have any hypertension. There is no um, cerebrovascular disease and the, the creatinine is less than 133. Or we have got extended criteria donor when they've got age more than 60 or they still have got age around 50, but they are either hypertensive or their creatinine is high or their cause of death is, is, is a CVA. So we have got a marginal donors and we have got uh, standard donors. And from marginal donors, it comes out to be that we can essentially do a dual kidney transplant for from, from those patients. And I'll actually skip these slides because this is how we put the transplant. Um, uh, if you see the right top uh, picture, we put one kidney on top of the other or one kidney on one side and other kidney on the other side. Um, just to give them a more nephron mice. So I would just um, uh, share um, a very interesting case with you. Um, so uh, this is, um, uh, if you concentrate here on the donor side and you see there is a 78 year old donor um, who had intracranial hemorrhage, hemorrhage, the creatinine was 88. But then if someone is 78 year old donor, uh, we become conscious about that. Do we take their kidney out or not as a, as a donor? So what we essentially did was we did a dual kidney transplant. So these kidneys were turned down by a couple of centers, other centers, they were offered to us. We accepted that kidney. Um, we put it in, in an, a 68 year old um, female and that kidney did very well. Um, it is, it has been around, uh, uh, for um, it was done in 2013, so it is almost uh, kind of coming up to eight years, and the kidney functions are are really very good. And then the other case was uh, from a 79 year old donor, and the, although creatinine was 61, uh, but then again, putting a 79 year old as a single kidney, um, it, it is something 
um, is um, the team is not that much comfortable because of, because of of the age related GFR um, decline, um, and therefore we put it in a 71 year old uh, male. It was again in 2013, and because the reason I pick these cases is these are the one where we have got a very good long term outcome, and we do have our very good long term outcome, which has been published on dual kidney um, transplantation. So dual kidney transplantation is an other thing that can someone can practice from adult and also from pediatric donors, we can do an unblocked transplantation to expand our um, transplant pr program. Then we also looked at um, successful utilization of living donors from over the age of 60. So again, the, th the, the same thing happened that there were challenges um, to uh, accept someone over 60 as a living donor because it was thought that when they donate their kidney, there might be some problem to them and that problem can cause problem. And it was happening quite a while back, about 10 years we published um, this work. Um, uh, we did this work and then, then published. And now it is uh, becoming uh, more common to take kidneys from um, uh, donors over um, 60. Um, there are some surgical challenges very quickly, multiple arteries. As I said, we have to do that, multiple ureters. We normally have to do that. If we do not do uh, or leave one ureter, it will cause hydronephrosis and it will have a problem with the kidneys. We sometimes have calcified vessels of the recipient. Um, we do some local um, um, kind of a, um, clearance of the calcified plaque, but if obviously it's a grossly calcified thing, we don't, we can't do much. We might have to explore someone's right side and left side and may end up not doing transplant um, at all. Someone may be challenging because they've got a very, very small bladder. You really, when they become anuric, their become, bladder becomes very small. And sometimes we might have to do intra-abdominal transplant because of the various things. We published our work in living uh, multiple renal arteries. We didn't find any different, significant difference about outcome and complication and various things. We also published about dual uh, double ureters and didn't find any significant difference um, in any of, uh, of these cases. Now I'm just going to uh, only spend three more minutes to uh, wrap up surgical complications. Um, so complication is a part of surgery. Um, I have yet to see a person or a surgeon who say he has done an operation without, a, without any complications. Um, so the major complication we need to worry about is a renal artery or renal vein thrombosis. And that is one of the one of the devastating complication where there's a high risk of craft loss if it happens. Um, so uh, essentially, um, uh, if uh, uh, if someone is a high risk of thrombosis, for example, someone have got SLE, they have got either any um, other um, kind of a, a history of uh, hypercoagulation. We sometimes have to put them on heparin. We have to sometimes put them on uh, aspirin or clopy or warfarin or various other things to prevent that uh, happening. Uh, peritransplant hematoma is not uncommon uh, if we do a scan, which is commonly done in all of the post-transplant patients. There is always, there is some kind of a hematoma or something sitting there. But as far as the hematoma is not compressing on the blood vessels, it is small, it is not infected, it is fine. We don't have to do it um, otherwise. Urinary leak is another complication. Um, it is um, uh, common in, in the first uh, month after transplantation, the incidence is about um, two to five percent, but now after putting this um, ureteric stent, which is co most commonly uh, put across uh, the world now, the incidence is less than that one percent. And if the treatment, if of a small urinary leak, is just put the Foley's catheterin, leave it for four weeks. The, as far as the anastomosis is dry, it will heal up. Sometimes we might have to insert an aphrostomy and a Foley's catheter and very rarely you might have to take back uh, to them to the surgery and do a reimplantation. Um, Lymphocele um, as another thing, um, which is again commonly seen in the scans, but it is only significant if it is infected or if it is compressing on vessels, risking a renal vein or renal artery thrombosis. And the last thing is obstructive uropathy. It can, it is more common in um, cadaveric DCD um, transplants when someone um, have died because of their uh, heart dead, um, and there is a long ischemia time, it can cause um, the stenosis because the anatomy of the ureter is that the top part of one third of the ureter is supplied by the renal artery, the lower one is from the zygal artery, and when that is a bit disconnected, the lower part of the ureter is more 
uh, vulnerable to ischemic injury. Treatment for that is usually dilatation and stenting and nephrostomy as an acute care, but sometime 20% of the time, we might have to do a higher uh, or ureteric reimplantation. And renal artery stenosis is again a complication uh, which can happen, usually presents with hypertension and the treatment is uh, um, angioplasty. Surgical treatment of renal artery stenosis is very rare. If we do that majority of the time, it can cause problem. Um, I think I will stop here because the rest of the complications are medical complications. I've got slides for them, but I think that will be out of context and I think we have it's almost uh, um, come to um, fifth, more than 50 minutes now. So I'll stop and I'm here. happy to take questions, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gazan, for a, a wonderful talk and uh, overview of uh, renal transplant. Um, I hope you don't mind taking some questions. I'll just ask some questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, what was the impact of COVID-19 on the transplant service for you at St. George's or in and around London? Right. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, uh, so globally, uh, essentially, the transplant program was impacted quite quite significantly with this um, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and now, depending upon, there are 28 um, transplant centers in in the UK with about five transplant centers within M25. Um, depending upon um, where that was a high R risk and our community prevalence was very high about COVID pandemic, that um, center has to stop their program. So for example, in, in St. George's, in the first surge, we have to shut down our program for about two and a half months. In a second surge, we have to shut down our program for about um, one and a half months. Um, because as I said, uh, somewhere in my presentation, although the, re the, you know, the prevalence of uh, um, COVID in renal uh, transplant patient has been less, much less than a dialysis patient, but once they get COVID, uh, the mortality was significantly high. Yeah, of course. And, um, um, and and another question from the UK is the UK has this opting out scheme in the for transplant. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Or can you enlighten us what that means? Right. OK, so this opt out um, uh, scheme is uh, is a Spanish model. So the highest number of do donors per million population is in Spain and the Spain okay. is an opt out system that I have to opt out. <clears throat> to be a donor unless um, otherwise. So essentially I am considered to be a donor unless I am willingly saying that after my death, I do not want to become a donor. Um, and this um, uh, was uh, in UK was an opt-in that I, if I want to become a donor, I will declare it or in, in when I'm alive that I want after my death, I'm I'm happy to become um, a donor. And then it, it is a soft uh, program as soft in a sense that even if I'm willing to donate my organ after my death and my family after my death is not happy or my next to kin, they think and they think they're not happy, essentially they can, um, we cannot proceed because we do not want to develop a culture where there's a lot of conflict and other things. Mm -hmm. So in Wales, um, uh, initially, um, um, three years ago, we uh, this program was, uh, by law, it was passed by assembly and it was an opt-out system that everyone, is going to be considered as a donor unless willingly they opt themselves out from that program. And this is now in UK as well. So it has increased the number of transplants essentially uh, by 5%. And the aim is if this um, rules out and, um, and battery um, kind of a, um, goes around in, in the United Kingdom, mm. and it is anticipated that the transplant number will go up uh, by 11% by 2030. Fantastic. And then, and again, with organ availability, what about those in the ethnic minority groups, Asians, Afro-Caribbean uh, communities in the UK? Is there a, a difference in um, availability for organs or what do you see in that community? Right. Okay. Well, that's a very, very good question. And that is actually one of my interests, which I have developed um, over, over the years as well. Um, uh, uh, so essentially, um, now, BAME population presents around 15 to 16% of patients who are on an um, organ waiting list. And again, um, we are all aware working in, in, 
in um, kind of European countries and states and other countries that Asian and Afro-Caribbean, they've got a high uh, prevalence of chronic kidney disease as compared to Caucasians. Yes. Uh, because of high risk of diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, various other things. Um, so about f about um, sixteen percent list is presented. Waiting list is presented. But when we come to the donor, our donor is around around two point six to three percent of our donor in the country is essentially uh, from BME group. So about ninety seven percent of our donation is coming from Caucasians. Mm. It has got two impact. One thing is because. Um, uh, when we come to HLA match, Asian population has to wait longer because obviously once we once we look at their um, ABO typing, that is fine, but HLA tissue typing, obviously because of our genetics and things are, it is challenging to, um, to, to do that. Uh, and therefore there is a lot, lot of work being done to promote this donation in BME population. Uh, it has slightly increased. We did a lot of work. We actually did a survey in, in our area in, in southwest of um, of uh, London, including Tooting and Wandsworth Council, um, and we looked at we did a A survey about um, what are kind of reasons for organ decline and other things, and there were various questions, various workshops being done. It's slightly increased, but there is a national drive to increase the organ in BME community, which has still been going off. At least I know it from five years. It has increased by about zero point five percent the number of donation but not that uh, it should have been gone. No, excellent. And then um, also, uh, how do we make these treatments um, cost-effective for economically less developed countries and those populations with limited access to medical facilities? And how would a, a country where maybe they don't have a service um, be able to think about starting a transplant service? What, what's your feeling about that part of the world? Right. Um, so I, uh, as, as my background, um, I did my obviously training in Pakistan and I was lucky enough to get involved in, in, in a very big transplant program in, in, in my work in Lahore. And actually, um, I before coming here, I had actually 100 and um, um, 407 transplant I was involved in. I think one of the key thing, which is, which is, uh, which is in developing countries, one of the understanding is it is no doubt um, that transplant will be cheaper. So there will be one off cost for doing a transplant, um, but then the maintenance immunosuppression uh, will be much, much cheaper than the hemodialysis. So when we are planning for a transplant program, we have to um, look at the broader, bigger picture that what will be the five-year outcome if, uh, if I have to dial as a patient for five years, what will be my cost mm. as compared to what will be my cost um, um, if I have to actually uh, do that transplant. So it will come uh, cheaper, about one third of the dialysis cost. I think the one thing will be to promote that culture of um, a living donor, which again uh, is something which we learned from our BAME population here um, is uh, it, it is cultural thing. It is not a religious thing. It is not um, something um, which is education. It is not something. It is something cultural in in BME population that they are not coming forward as a donor either in their life or after their death. I think that culture has to change. Um, and there are very good successful transplant program at least in India or in Pakistan and in the other countries. Uh, so the, the, the solution is not with the clinicians only, it is with the whole of the society, they have to change, they have to think about, and I think it is a mass education, um, uh, what we can do, for example, in UK, we have done some mass education programs in different mosques, we have engaged different uh, people to come um, and speak about organ donation from religious scholars to, um, to big leader of the BME community. Um, to come forward and speak to the community and i think that is that is the solution in my in uh, that i can think of thank you and and i think uh just the last question because of time and sorry if i didn't ask all the questions because it's such an interesting talk but what about the quality of life of these patients post transplant and uh and the survival and what's the longest known survival is it a normal uh normal life expectancy after a transplant um, yes, so um, so life expectancy after uh, after transplantation is um, essentially superior um, to uh, any other dialysis uh, modality. Um, so um, the 
average um, graft expectancy of a live donor is 23 years. So that is graft expectancy, not patient expectancy. Hmm. Patient uh, life expectancy can be much superior than the graft expectancy, but a, a, a live donor graft can last on an on a, up to um, 23 years. But I, in my own, um, I've, I've seen someone who is um, actually have got um, a transplant before I was born. I was born in 74, so the, he had a transplant in 70s. So his kidney was even older than, than me. Um, so, um, and, and, and for, for cadaveric transplant, a good cadaveric transplant, an average life expectancy is between 13 to 14 years. Um, for, a, for a DCD and for a DBD, it is 15 to 17 years. So the graft survival um, is very good. And because of the recent immunosuppression uh, protocols and various other things, which picking problems early and sorting out problems early, life expectancy is definitely um, increasing. And one person um, can have uh, two, three, four transplant, um, up to five transplants. So I have done someone's fifth transplant two or three times. Um, so you can imagine that mm -hmm. how many years of quality of life you can add on um, to someone's life. Brilliant. Uh, before I hand over to uh, uh, Ms. Schiffer, I want to thank Dr. Gazanfra from all the panelists and the attendees today. A wonderful talk, wonderful overview of a very important subject. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gazanfra, and thank you to our attendees. I'll hand over to Sister Schiffer for the final closing comments. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shabi, for um, uh, moderating the session, and of course, uh, Dr. Abbas Kazanfer for um, enlightening us. You know, um, we're getting many, many comments in the chat about um, uh, how wonderful this presentation was, and we hope to have you back very soon. Um, so, what I'll do is before we leave uh, is just to remind everyone of SIVU's ongoing activities. Um, I'll share my screen here. Um, we have, of course, a, a very large um, schedule um, and our, our schedule continues. So I would like to remind everyone of our upcoming lecture, which is um, on Saturday, June 5th uh, at 11 a.m. GMT, the same time with Dr. Siraj Ali Muhammad of India. Uh, he will be speaking on building and sustaining online communities of inquiry in HPE. And that will be moderated by Dr. Sujita Dandikar. So, um, we welcome you all back and um, please uh, look to your inboxes in the next coming days for your participation certificates as well. So thank you again, everyone. And, um, and we hope to see you again very soon. <laughs>